Wood is so beautiful to praise the Lord together. Let's praise the Lord wherever you are on planet Earth today. Hallelujah. Oh, 
I just want to sit here at your feet, Father. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught Never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you. I forgot that you're enough 
2020 online. We're glad that you've joined with us today. We're going to, at the end of this service, partake of communion. I trust you've already prepared your elements for that, and that will happen at the end of this service. I want you to turn your Bible to Revelation chapter 2. We continue our series of seven letters to the seven churches of Revelation. This is the second letter to the second church. The second letter is to Smyrna. And we find that scripture in Revelations, again, chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. The other day, I was reading something that reminded me of something that's important to me and important to you, and that is this. Jesus is coming soon. I believe that. And I look forward to his return for his church. He said he is going to return, and he's looking for a church that is prepared. Are you ready? Are you prepared for the return of Jesus Christ? I know you can be. I trust that you are. And how do we be prepared? Personal relationship with Jesus Christ. To know him as our personal Lord and Savior, Jesus. That's good news to me. Good news to you as well. The other day I was reading and I ran across a statement that startled me. Uh, when you are reading in the course of this season and time, it seems like we've gotten to a point where we almost can't be startled anymore because for a period of time it seemed like we were startled all the time, constantly, every day, a new thing to learn, and we perhaps got a little callous to that. But this, this startled me. It was a statement of a religious leader. And here's what he said. I have too much 
fun declaring the, and demonstrating the kingdom of God, it's okay if he waits till he returns. I want to read that again. I have too much fun declaring and demonstrating the kingdom of God. It's okay if he waits till he returns. That is the most ludicrous statement I think I have ever heard in my life. Now, in part, I believe that. I, I, I concur that, that I'm having a lot of fun serving the Lord. It is, it is a pleasure to be a child of God and to see his grace and mercy bestowed not only in my life but in the lives of those who will yield their life to Christ. To, to, to see a demonstration of his love, mercy, and grace, and power within the church. But I'm here to declare, you, declare to you, it's not okay with me if he waits. I, I look forward to the return, and I, I am anticipating the soon return of Jesus Christ. In fact, the only thing that would hinder me from declaring, even so, Lord, come now, or come quickly, would be that there are so many people that need Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The real issue is not in refusing to believe in the second coming of Jesus, though there are many who do. Apparently this gentleman was not altogether thrilled with his coming. But that's not the issue. The issue is not in refusing to believe in the second coming of Jesus. The issue is believing it, yet living like he's not going to return, or living like we're not prepared for his return. I want you to read our text now. Again, Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. And I'm reading from the New International Version. Revelations 2, 8 through 11. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write, These are the words of the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. And for here we hear the commendation. I know your affliction and your poverty, even though you are rich. I know the slander on the part of those who say that they are Jews but are not but are a synagogue of Satan. And then we come to the word of correction, a mild word of, of encouragement to their, their church. Verse 10, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Beware about the devil. Is going to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have affliction. Be faithful until death and I will give you a crown of life. Let anyone who has ear to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Whoever conquers will not be harmed by the second death. The commendation, I know your afflictions and your poverty, even though you are rich. The correction, do not fear what you are about to suffer. I want us to look firstly at the church, the city. Its name has several meanings. The most literal meaning of Smyrna is bitter. Bitter or resinous, dried up sap. Well, that's quite a name for a city, isn't it? It doesn't sound like a kind of city that would draw a lot of uh, vacationers. <laughs> resinous, dried up sap. But it also means suffering. Again, I'm not sure I would want to take a vacation in a, in a town called Suffering. But it can also mean myrrh, which is symbolic of death and used for embalming. Now, this is what the name... Now, what's interesting is it, it, it seems as though the name of the city, though Christians did not choose this name, that this name was a prophetic demonstration or a prophetic uh, statement about what the church of Jesus Christ in that day would be dealing with, what they would be confronted with. It is located about 300, excuse me, about 25 to 40 miles north of Ephesus, which I think is interesting. 25, 35 to 40 miles is not considered a long distance today. And we can get a car and drive probably about 30 minutes, 35 minutes to get to 35 miles. But in, in this day and time, it was a good long trek. It was a seaport town like was Ephesus. And it was noted as a center of science and medicine. And we find that Jesus reminds the church, first of all, of his suffering. Before he enters in and begins to speak about what they're going to be going through, a prophetic word about what they would be facing, first he tells them, remember what I went through. We find in verse 8, it says to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write, these are the words of the first and the last who was dead and came to life. 
This is interesting that this church would be facing persecution. But Jesus reminds them of his suffering and of the consequences of his suffering. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 says this, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Verse 21, For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as Adam for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all are made alive. Interesting that, that Jesus would begin his word to the church dealing with himself. Well, obviously, he is the savior of the church. And, and you know, in the first century church, they were recognizing that it was an honor to be even considered to be martyred for Christ, to be tried for Christ. That was considered a, a blessing in the apostles' day. In fact, you know the disciples, all but one, were martyred for their faith. They chose to die rather than denounce their faith in Jesus Christ. Only John, the writer of Revelation, and, and his wasn't a vacation resort. And, and so Jesus reminds them that his death, his resurrection, brought something into our life as well. And then we look now at the commendation to the church. It, he, he first of all recognizes that they were submitted to Rome. The population of Rome was, or excuse me, of Smyrna was approximately 200 to 250,000 people. It was a large, large city in that day and time. In fact, it'd be considered a large city today. And they submitted, the church submitted to the authority of Rome. It was a center of emperor worship. They called Caesar. Lord. In fact, there was an annual certificate that was given to those who worshipped Caesar and consequences of those who resisted. Now, I think what's interesting that even in the day of this church, the second letter of the seven letters to the seven churches of Revelation, that they were commended for submitting to authority, even though the authority was pagan, even though the authority was contrary to God's word. But First Peter speaks to us, and I believe this is something that we today, 2020, that we need to hear, that we need to understand. Let it be a word to us. First Peter chapter 2, verse 13 says, Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Verse 15, for it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. What is interesting to me is today we have leaders, governors, presidents, congressmen and women, senators, and they're not of our party. Of, are not in, we're not in agreement with them, and so we just reject them. But the Bible says, regardless of what you think, this church had every reason to resist Rome, but they didn't. They didn't. And I would just say to you this morning, as the Scripture says, for the Lord's sake, as a witness and a testimony, we have to be cautious and careful of the words that we speak, for we represent God's kingdom. They were unwilling to compromise their faith. We find here that Jesus acknowledges their spiritual condition. And, and this, I think this would be a, a commendation to any church if they heard these words. Verse 9 says, I know your affliction and your poverty even though you are rich. I know the slander on the part of those who say that they are Jews, but they are not. They are of the synagogue of Satan. You see, Jesus is not impressed with our accomplishments. Jesus is not impressed with what we can do or what we have done. He's not impressed with our wealth or the wealth of the church. He's not impressed with our intellect. The Bible tells us that our minds cannot comprehend the things of God. God is not impressed with our influence, our power, or our authority. None of those things impress God. What impresses God is our heart. He says to the church, I know your afflictions. And I want you to know this morning, regardless of what you're going through today, regardless of what you are facing in this very moment, 
It may be difficult. It may be heart-wrenching. But I want you to know this. Hear me. Jesus is aware of your needs. Jesus knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. And to this church, he says to them, I know your afflictions. You may be feeling afflicted today. You may be feeling down and out today. You may be going through the roughest time of your life. Sincerely, this is about the roughest time I've had in, in the history of my life. And yet, Jesus is aware of what we're going through. The Bible says he's touched with a feeling of our infirmity. He knows what we're going through. And the term is, that we're discussing here is intense suffering and anguish. It, it's, not just, it's not just that they were going through a mild a depression. Uh, they weren't just going through a mild problem. This was severe in every sense of the word. It was suffering and it was anguish. And Jesus said, I know what you're going through. He says, I know your poverty. I think this is interesting that Jesus would make this mention that I know your poverty. Because of their faith, they lost everything. They lost jobs because of their faith. They lost their possessions because of their faith. They lost their e earthly security, not because they had done anything wrong, but because of their faith. You know, it's one thing to lose something when you've done something wrong, and there's no one to blame but yourself. It's another thing to learn lose everything, and you've done nothing. In fact, we would, we would proclaim, we would declare, this is unfair, and truly it would be unfair. But rather than denounce their faith, they lost everything. And still, Jesus says, I know your poverty. And yet, he says next, yet I know you are rich. Well, when somebody's looking at this, you think, what in the world is he seeing? He just said they're poverty stricken. He just acknowledged that they had lost everything. Now he says they're rich. And that's the key. The riches of the kingdom are not the riches of this world. And I think we need to be reminded of that. I think we need to embrace that within our hearts to realize that the riches of the kingdom of God are not synonymous with the riches of this world. The Bible says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? The world would consider that rich. If, if the world were measuring this church, they would consider this church anything but rich. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. Because God doesn't measure, measure wealth in terms of earthly possessions. We want to read Luke chapter 12, verse 15. It says, a man's life does not consist of a, the abundance of his possessions. Well, that's the way the world measures it. If you possess a lot, you're rich. If you own a lot, you're rich. If you can buy anything you want, you're rich, but not in God's kingdom. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21 says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, what you value is determined by what's in your heart. And this church, though they were poverty stricken in the eyes of the world, they were rich in the eyes of the world of God. I think we have a choice. And, and I hasten to add that God is not opposed to possessions. God is not opposed to wealth. God is opposed to those things possessing us. To that being the confidence of our life. That that be the primary pursuit of our life. And by the way, when you get to heaven, God is not going to ask you how big your house was. He's not going to ask you how much your car cost or what, how new model it was. None of those things are going to impress God. What we desire to hear from the Lord is God saying, I see that you're rich in kingdom riches, yet I know that you're rich. Contrary to the accepted ways of Smyrna and this world, this church's riches were in kingdom riches. Luke chapter 12, verse 29 and 31 from the English Standard Version says this, And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. And by the way, if God knows that you need them, God is going to see that you have what you need. Verse 31, Instead, seek his kingdom, and all of these things will be added 
to you. Seek first the kingdom of God. And if we have the right priorities in our life, and God's kingdom, God's riches, are, are the value of our heart, then everything else is gonna fall in place. We may be, we may have big houses, we may have big cars, and, and that's not the riches of God. But even if we have the wealth of the world, but our priority is the heart of God, we are of all people most rich. And though we could lose it all, like this church did, we could lose it all, we could still remain rich when our priorities are for the heart of God. Years ago, as I was reading this scripture, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, instead seek the kingdom, his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. And the Holy Spirit spoke these words to me in a paraphrase. Seek first the king, for where the king is, his kingdom is. And I might add, seek first the king, and where the king is, the king's riches are. And I want to encourage you, as he said, as the scripture says, I know, I, I know what the world may consider your life. I know what the world may deem your life to be, but let's hear the word of God say to us today, but I see, God saying, I see that you are rich. We do not impress God with our accomplishments but with our faith and our obedience. And then he says, I know you resisted replacing relationship with religion. Now this is the problem with the church at Ephesus. The charge problem with a lot of churches today, so many believers today. Verse nine says, I know the slander on the part of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. You see, the Jews were bound by their traditions. And I'm concerned today that there are many Christians, believers that are bound by their traditions. And by that I mean they do what they do without realizing why they do what they do. And I can tell you this, if we do something and we don't know why we're doing it and it's not the priority or the value of our life, it won't be long, hear me, it won't be long until we'll not be doing it any longer. The Jews were bound by their traditions. Matthew chapter 15 verse 8 and 9 says, but these people show honor to me with their words, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is worthless. The things they teach are nothing more but human rules. Let that not be ever be said of Brazewood. But more importantly, let that never be said of you and me. Matthew chapter 15, scripture we just read, was not the church of Smyrna. They were not bound by that tradition. They were never willing to replace relationship with God for religion. See, people bound by their tradition or by their religion are prevalent among Christians who have lost their first love. But it's not this church. It's not what their heart what their spirit was. Romans 2, 28 and 29 says, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. In other words, again, God is not impressed with what you do on the outside if what's in your heart is not right. Nor the circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly and the circumcision that is in the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. We don't want to be those people or that kind of church that does the right things on the outside, looks right and correct on the outside, but on the inside, our heart is wrong. These were commendations. Yet, there was a word of correction. The church of Smyrna received a mild correction. In fact, probably more like a warning. Verse 10 says, do not fear. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Fear is a powerful emotion. In fact, the Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's one emotion or one, one spirit, not the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and of love and peace of mind. So when God takes that powerful emotion and that powerful spiritual context out of our life, he replaces it with three, the power of love, the power of the spirit, and the power of a sound mind. That's how powerful fear can be. And to this church with all that they're about to go through and the prophetic word of what is to happen, Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. See, the correction had to do with fear, anxiety, 
distress and panic. And, and don't you know, if we had been told that we were going to be going through hard and difficult, dark times, perhaps that emotion might be stirred up within our heart as well, fear. We might have a sense of anxiety. We might have a sense of, of, of panic. Maybe in going through what you have gone through in this last three months, maybe you've experienced some of those emotions. And I want you to know, Jesus would say to you today, I know, I know. Not in the sense of condemnation, not in the sense of, 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 of disappointment, but in the sense that I know I understand what you're going through. And when God understands what you're going through and what I'm going through, he has an answer to that. He doesn't leave us hopeless. He doesn't leave us in fear. He has an answer. God always has an answer. It's natural to experience fear. It's natural to experience fear. If you, were new, you, if you knew you were about to be persecuted, and yet he says, don't fear. Don't be afraid. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, in me you may have peace. In the world, you'll have tribulation. We know what that's like. But take courage. I have overcome the world. The circumstances that you see might engender or generate fear or anxiety. But when Jesus steps into your life, and when Jesus steps into that circumstance, he brings his peace with him. And that peace surpasses all understanding. In this season, we must prepare ourselves to respond to hard times, to difficult times. And here's the purpose. Here's, here's the promise. Verse 10 says, Beware the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested. Well, that's not positive. And for 10 days you will have affliction. Well, that's not positive. Be faithful to death. Whoa. I don't know, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, that's positive. <laughs> Listen to this. You, usually, when you think about promises, you think about them in the context of looking forward to it. You, you look at the context of, I can't wait until this promise is fulfilled. It's, it's something positive. It's something affirming. But the promises that they're given, the prophetic word they're given, is not something that you would jump up and down and go, whoopee, can't wait to get a hold of this. But this was a promise of more suffering. It already endured suffering. And it's a promise of more suffering. It's a promise that they're going to be cast into prison without a trial. They're going to go to court on false charges. It's a promise that they're even going to be executed. Well, I don't see a long line for any of those things. I think if, if, a, if a prophet from God were to come into the church today and prophesy, church, you're about to go through hard times. There's a lot of us that would reject that prophetic word. We would say, Satan, get behind me. And yet, God had a purpose for bringing this instruction into their life and for speaking it into our lives today. You see, they had a promise of facing death. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39, I'll only to read a portion. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or, the, or danger of the sword? For it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37, No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. They had a promise of facing death. But ultimately, ultimately, the promise was a reward for the overcomers, for those that would overcome, for those that would endure. Verse 10 and 11 says, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you a crown of life and will give you, he, will, he who has ear, let him hear what the, church, what the church says to the spirit. He who overcomes will not be hurt by, at all by the second coming. You see, they had a promise of faith instead of fear. Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6 says, God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, and I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? It's almost a challenge. That if God be for me, nobody can be against me. 
There was a promise of faith instead of fear. There's a promise of a crown instead of judgment. In James chapter 1, verse 12, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive a crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. It's a crown that will last forever. The promise of a resurrection instead of death. Emotional, spiritual, eternal, and physical death. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. I want, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering to become like him in his death so that somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. You see, they had a choice. They had a choice. And their choice was to choose faith over fear. We have that same choice. We have that same choice today as we face trials and tribulations. We have the choice of choosing God, choosing our faith, choosing what's in our heart, choosing God's word over fear that will grip many. We have the choice of a crown instead of judgment. Every choice that we make leads us someplace. We have the promise of a resurrection instead of death. A resurrection emotional, spiritual, eternal, and a resurrection physical. The Bible tells us that we have in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 through 11, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. That's a resurrection is a promise to each and every one of us. I am not a prophet, and I'm not here to declare that life is going to get hard for us. But in my own life, I have considered things. Years ago, I read a book called Fox's English Book of Martyrs. And it gave witness of men and women who were brutalized at the hands of man over their faith. Many of them were given a choice of denying what they believed, denying, denying the truth, denying God's word, or being put to death, or being tortured. And rather than give up their faith, rather than denying their faith, they chose to be faithful. You know, it'd be wonderful if the story was they were miraculously let out and prison doors were open and they were freed, but most of them perished. Most of them died. And the Bible says those that are martyred will receive a crown, will receive a glorious reward for their faithfulness in, in light of denial. I've often thought, if I'm ever put in that place where I have to make a choice, what would I do? I think sometimes we can determine the outcome beforehand if we'll just make a decision. What will I do? If I were given the choice, deny Christ or die, what would I do? If I were given the, the choice, deny your faith or be tortured, what would I do? I'm not sure any of us really know, but I do know this. I believe there is a grace that God gives to those who are going through hardship. And I've never gone through anything like that, not even close, not even minutely close. But I can tell you, in the hardships that I've gone through, I have felt the grace and mercy of God in my life. I have sensed not only his presence, but his strength carry me through those difficult times. And I've made a decision. And I don't say this arrogantly or pridefully at all, but I've made a decision that regardless of what comes in my life, I will not deny my faith. Regardless of what I may encounter, I will not deny my faith because my faith is more precious to me than silver and gold. My faith is more precious to me than a convenient life because this life is temporal. It's temporary. It lasts a short time, 80, 90, 100 years and then we're gone. This life is finished. And when I step from this life into the portals of heaven, that's when I really know what life is. And that won't be temporary. That will be eternal. So let's choose the promise. Even though there may be suffering, tribulation, and death, ultimately there are a reward for those who will overcome. Here's the choice. You choose today. It's the promise of faith instead of fear. You have to make that decision. 
That decision is yours today and tomorrow. Choose the promise, the promise of a crown instead of judgment, to persevere, to continue on, not to give up, not to give in, not to choose the easy way, but to choose the right way. Can I say, sometimes the right way is the harder way to choose, but you choose the righteous way. Choose the promise. Choose the promise of the resurrection instead of death. It may be that we choose death today so that we might live eternally. It may be that we choose what the world considers death and we know through Jesus Christ that is really living life to its fullest. Choose the promise. This is what God is saying to the second church of the seven letters to the seven churches. Choose the promise. Choose a promise of faith over fear. Choose a promise of the crown over judgment. And choose the promise of resurrection instead of death. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of caution. Don't be afraid. I believe, Heavenly Father, that you will give me grace if I'm ever called upon to make a decision between choosing righteousness or unrighteousness. I believe, Heavenly Father, you will give me the strength that is necessary to endure whatever hardships or tribulations that I might go through, not because I'm strong, but because you are strong in me. Father, I pray today that we will awaken. If we have chosen tradition over relationship, that we will awaken today, that you will bring conviction and correction into our hearts so that we can say no to tradition and yes to relationship with a living God. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we will choose. We will choose faith instead of fear in our tribulation. We will choose the promise of a crown instead of judgment, choosing what is right in your eyes, and that we will choose the promise of the resurrection promise of the resurrection instead of death. Father, that comes because I have a relationship with you. And we give you thanks. And pray for anyone here today who does not have a personal relationship with you, that these words may cause them fear. And that's not your heart. At the thought of Jesus coming again should not engender fear within our heart, but joy and excitement to know that we are ready and prepared. If there's anyone, Father, that does not have that personal daily relationship with you, today let them be the day that they pray that simple prayer, Father, forgive me of every sin I've committed. Forgive me of all the wrong I've ever done. And you said, in your word, you have promised us that you are faithful and you are just and you will forgive us of all of our sins. But not only forgive us, Lord, but you change us. You transform our lives so that we truly live and have a life worth living. And for those that have prayed that prayer, Father, we give you thanks. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to remind you that next Sunday, our seven letters to the seven churches take us to Pergamos, the compromising church. Read with me Revelations chapter 2 and study with me about that wonderful and needed spirit within our lives. We are going to partake of communion now. This is something that we do on the first Sunday of every month, and I have asked and suggest that in your home you are prepared with something to drink, juice, wine, bread, and we will partake together. And understand that we want to remember. It's what the Word says. Do this and remember to me. We want to remember that this is a season to be prepared, prepared to hear God. This is a season to prepare to pre represent the kingdom in such a way that God is honored. It is our preparation for Christ's return. We hold the bread in our hands. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, it says... When they had given thanks, he broke the bread and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Our declaration today is, I am healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ, 
and I stand upon the promises of God's word and confess that I am healed and healthy in Jesus' name. And COVID-19 will not touch my life or my family in Jesus' name. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Father, we partake together, remembering the sacrifice of Jesus so that we could entertain life abundant, health and healing each and every day. And for that we say, thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Let us partake together. This is the body of Jesus Christ. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25 says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This is an expression of God's love for you today. For us to remember, do this in remembrance of me. And our statement of faith and declaration today is, I am forgiven and delivered through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I am forgiven of all of my sins and set free from all habits that control my life. I am an overcoming, world-changing child of God in Jesus' name. And Jesus said, whenever you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. Father, we partake, having been set free through the blood of Jesus Christ, receiving not only forgiveness, but life abundant and eternal. And for that, we say thank you, Father, and we do remember and we do say thank you in Jesus name amen praise the Lord praise the Lord healing and health and forgiveness is our destiny our heritage as children of the most high God I want to encourage you in your stewardship that this is not a time to back away as with this church that we just dealt with, this is not a time to consider the riches of this world, but rather the riches of God's kingdom. And our theme for the month of August is God will make a way. <laughs> I believe that. God will make a way. In fact, the Bible says when there doesn't seem to be a way, when we can't navigate our way through, when there is no appearance of an answer, God will make a way. And how many of you know nothing can keep God? Nothing can stand in God's way. Daniel chapter 3, verse 22 through 25, dealing with the three Hebrew children, it says, The king's command was very strict, and the furnace was made so hot that the flames killed the strong soldiers who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace. They were firmly tied, and they fell into the burning furnace. And then the king Nebuchadnezzar was so surprised, verse 24, he was so surprised that he jumped to his feet and he asked the men who had advised him, didn't we tie up only three men and throw them into the fire? Their answer was, yes, O king. The king answered and said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire. and They're not tied up and they're not burned. And the fourth man looks like the son of God. Isn't it interesting that even a heathen king like Nebuchadnezzar could recognize the presence of Jesus? And first, furthermore, in this situation, God made a way, didn't he? God made a way. You know, in the natural, there is no way. You get thrown into a burning furnace, a fiery furnace, and it's stoked up as hot as that one was, you're going to burn. You're going to burn up. But when Jesus is in that furnace with you, he will make a way. God always makes a way. So when trouble comes, and remember to this church, the second letter of the seven churches, Jesus said, I know, I know. And when trouble comes, keep standing. When trouble comes, keep hoping in the Lord. When trouble comes, keep believing. Why? Because God will make a way. Thank you for your stewardship. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for God's blessing in your life and your willingness to invest in the kingdom of God in riches that will be for eternity. On behalf of the pastors and the deacons fellowship leadership of Braisewood, we want to say thank you so very much. And in just a moment, I'm going to end this service, but I just want to say two things. First of all, we always end the service with these words, relax. Relax. Remember, Jesus says, I, I know what you're going through. I'm watching. Relax. God is in control. 
And I want you to know that Don and I love you with all of our heart. And we pray for you daily, daily. We lift you before the throne of God. And I pray, regardless of what is in the nation, what is in the world today, regardless of what the news media may say, I pray that this week will be the best week you have ever known in your life. And God will bless you. Don and I love you. We love you so much. We enjoy being able to be with you. Would you please stay tuned for just a moment for some upcoming Brazewood announcements? I believe something will bless you and and be an encouragement to your heart as well. We love you. God bless. 